Well, we've got a lot of stuff tonight, so let's get right at it. Chantel is in Montreal. Andrew's away this week. Paul Wells is here in Ottawa. And so is, on the cover of this year's always influential Powerless magazine in Ottawa, the host <laughs> of Power and Politics, making her ad issue debut, Rosemary Barton, trying to look like this is just another normal day <laughs> for Rosie. No pressure. We, yeah, no pressure. All right. Um, Politics of pipelines. You know, it, we kind of hinted at this last week after the mayor of Montreal got things involved, but now it's taken on a whole new dimension. And would somebody please explain to me what is going on here on this story? Chantel? Uh, what is going on and is what has been going on, and that is there are three major pipeline projects on the drawing board, two of them in BC, Northern Gateway, which I suspect will not happen that the Liberals in Ottawa don't support and have made virtually impossible despite the fact that it's approved by banning tanker traffic uh, close to the port where this was going to bring the oil. Uh, Kinder Morgan, which is the expansion of a pipeline uh, from it, uh, that already exists to the BC coast and the Vancouver area, and that's important, Vancouver area. And then Energy East, which came later in the game and which would through uh, an extension of, of a pipeline, bring oil to New Brunswick, through Ontario and Quebec, of course, Manitoba and Saskatchewan. So in that order, Northern Gateway is, I think, by most people considered dead. Kinder Morgan uh, is opposed by the city council of uh, Metro Vancouver, the mayors there. They did that in May, in case you didn't notice. They said pretty much the same things Denis Coder said about that pipeline. Uh, the government of British Columbia early in January told the National Energy Board that it couldn't support uh, Kinder Morgan uh, and its Trans Mountain Pipeline for uh, fear of an oil spill and for lack of proof that uh, the company was able to handle it. And then you've got Energy East and you know what's happened there. So basically you're looking at uh, three pipelines on the drawing board for years not going anywhere and very unlikely to be accepted. Uh, by the government, municipal or provincial in British Columbia and Quebec, and the Liberals who this week, uh, I think, have bought time by putting in interim measures and extending the timeline to try to rebuild some acceptance for at least one of those pipelines and presumably for the two that are more likely to survive. Okay, you did great in trying to explain <laughs> the background for us on all that, but you ended up on the point. Uh, that yesterday in terms of what the Liberals did. Here's the back and forth between the Liberals and the Conservatives yesterday, which really underlines the politics of pipelines right now. Watch this. We are not going to get natural resources to market unless we do it in a sustainable way. That doesn't mean projects aren't going to go ahead. They're just going to have to show that they're being done in a, in a way that minimizes the impact on the environment. Unfortunately, the previous government did not do that. This is not good, good news for uh, those whose jobs depend on, uh, on, uh, on, on, on their, their very jobs depend on the natural resources sector. It's not positive. It's um, unfortunately a trend that seems to be uh, very, very quickly developing with this government. All right, well, not surprisingly, the Liberals and the Conservatives are uh, at each other on this particular one, but where does it actually leave us? Paul, what's your take? Well, it leaves us uh, with uh, a, a decreased likelihood that we're ever going to get uh, oil to tankers by uh, pipeline uh, in this country. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not sure that it's possible to avoid this outcome. Um, the Conservatives were very upset th uh, this week because it made the Liberals seem to be complicating the process by consulting more broadly, by, uh, by making sure they had the approval of Aboriginal groups and things like that. But, you know, almost exactly four years ago, in a speech to the Vancouver Board of Trade, Jim Prentice, who until uh, just before that had sat at uh, Stephen Harper's right hand in the federal cabinet, gave a speech in which... Uh, he sounded an awful lot like Catherine McKenna yesterday. He said uh, that the duty to consult with Aboriginal groups is not something that someone made up. It's a constitutional obligation on the federal government. And that the danger was not that uh, projects would be rejected. It's that they would pass the regulatory process and then get bogged down in courts because ordinary citizens couldn't stand the thought of them. Uh, what, the feds, what, the, what the Liberals have sought to do this week is to avoid exactly the fate that Jim Prentice predicted. And Jim Prentice didn't have a good year in politics last year, but his, his prediction of 2012 has stood up pretty, pretty well. Stephen Harper couldn't get that oil out either. 
Rosie, you talked to all the players on PNP throughout these last couple of days. What do you make of it all? Well, there's a couple of phrases that keep coming up, and I think that they are important to the Liberal government, but I'm not sure that they're going to get them what they want. The first one is social license. They think that talking to more people and listening to more people and having more people be allowed to say where they stand on these issues will give the government the social license to move forward. I'm not sure that that's what cons consultation translates into all the time. And then the second phrase that, that stood out for me was national interest, and that's something that the Natural Resources Minister Jim Carr repeated again and again that they will take all of this back to cabinet now including this enhanced look at greenhouse gas emissions that happen indirectly and directly from these pipelines and they will look and, and evaluate whether this particular pipeline is in the national interest however they don't define what national interest means so uh, would it be because it's going to create a hundred thousand jobs would it be because it's uh, going to emit too many greenhouse gases emissions this will be a decision made around the cabinet table and and so long as there are no metrics for the rest of us to look at what the cabinet is looking at I think that that could still be very hard for the government to sell and potentially politically risky for them to bring it so close to them in terms of where the decision ends up if okay. it, we've learned anything about national interest is it is that it, when it's defined in Ottawa it doesn't always wash in the provinces to yeah. to which it is told and I bring this example potash corp and the sale of it was considered in the national interest by Stephen Harper, but not by the Premier of Saskatchewan, Brad Wall, and it didn't happen. I want to quickly shift topics because I want to cover two areas still tonight. And one is something the Speaker has been on and on about since he was elected, and he's done it twice this week. And it's about the, the mood in the House and his desire that hecklings stop. Here's what he said today. Yesterday was really good, folks. <laughs> Let's get back to that nice tone of respect. It's tough because we hear things we don't like sometimes, you know? But I'm sure in private meetings that happens too. And we can control ourselves. So let's try to do that. You know, nobody else seems to be too interested in this. I find it fascinating. They really, they're trying to stop heckling in the House of Commons. Is that even possible, Paul? <laughs> Uh, all things are possible, Peter. And you know, uh, during the last few months of Jack Layton's life, for much of the time that uh, Tom Mulcair was leader of the opposition, on the opposition side, heckling had declined. Um, I'm struck by Jeff Regan's decision as a new speaker to not be like the last several speakers who served honorably and thoughtfully, and at the end of their t tenure in, in, in that chair, nobody could remember that they'd done a thing. He seems intent on actually trying to change the place. And I suspect, I'm, I'm going to be naive and, and uh, here, I think most Canadians actually agree that it, it should be possible to sit for 45 minutes in that room and not act like a horse. Uh, we'll, we'll see whether it's possible. Well, I guess there's somewhere between acting like a horse and some of the, you know, debate type heckling that does occur in, in many parliaments. You're shaking your head, Chantal. You just think, it's, get it's, rid of it? I'm sorry. Maybe it's because I, I'm a woman and I've watched too many women be heckled uh, and right. drowned out because their voices are weaker. But to me, it looks like bullying. Uh, and it doesn't feel like debate at all. And I watched question period this week. I know that the main offenders heckling at this point uh, are sitting uh, in the conservative benches. I find that passing strange when I consider that their house leader, is that it, is the previous speaker? Uh, it, it kind of says something, but I, I find it does nothing constructive. I watch the National Assembly where there's very little heckling, and I find it more conducive to intelligent conversations. All right. Well, I take your point on the, you know, on heckling against women. There's, there's, there's no room for that, and there has been, but in spite of the fact that it, it happens, and it has happened a lot. Rosie, what are, what are you hearing on well, I went up today because I knew that you were going to ask me, did you see any hecklers? And indeed, the, the current House leader, Conservative House leader, who was the former speaker, I did witness with my own eyes a couple of jeers while someone was answering a question. So how quickly they turn from, uh, you know, the, the referee to participant in the sport. I, you know, a couple of things. The Samara Foundation, which, as you know, does all this great work around how to keep our parliament healthy, uh, did release a report about heckling and jeering, and they found that most Canadians are very turned off by it. However, I am going to be the outlier here. 
I like it. <laughs> I go up there and I like to see that people are lively and engaged. I think sometimes people are heckling just so they, they can feel like they're part of the debate, so they can have things registered on Hansard, which registers you know, things that are picked up. Um, I think it motivates the, the troops, as it were. I think it keeps the politicians feisty and passionate. I, I don't think, as Chantal says, it always leads to super public policy debate, but I'm not sure that that's what question period is about anyway. So if it's not going to be about that, I'd rather be entertained, frankly. Right. Well, it could be about that. That's the point. Well, I, I don't know when. Maybe last century it was about that, but it hasn't yeah, been I like that Yeah, I was there last while. century, and sometimes it was. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> well, to pick up in a way on, on Chantel's earlier point uh, about women in the House of Commons. Yeah. Let me show you a picture from 100 years ago. It was in Manitoba. These are the women who were responsible 100 years ago today for women getting the right to vote. First time in Canada. Happened in the province of Manitoba. Rosie's hometown. Um, and uh, then, of course, it spread across the country eventually. It took a while in some parts of the country. Uh, but it eventually spread right across the country. So here we are 100 years later and broaden the topic. Assess where we are in terms of women in politics in Canada on what is kind of a historic anniversary. Where are we? Where, where do we still need to go, Chantal? We are not where we would want to be, but uh, we, we, we are still going forward. There seemed to be a time post Kim Campbell and that defeat uh, where nothing was happening. We have uh, women premiers in the major provinces. Uh, Three out of four. Today is a good day to ask that question because uh, I think the Quebec cabinet looked old after Justin Trudeau made up his cabinet and the new cabinet today in Quebec, its main feature is there are more women and not only that, some of them actually have positions of power. So slowly but surely. Paul? Uh, as Chantal pointed out, we're not asking this question in the vacuum of recent uh, experience. We're asking it in the wake of Justin Trudeau's decision to uh, make sure that half of his cabinet was women. And before that happened, there was a lot of, I think, you know, understandable concern that, well, we want to make sure that we're p picking people for cabinet on merit and not based on some sort of extraneous consideration. But the fact is, 100 days into this government, if you were to try and, and go through the exercise of, of, of allocating ministers into uh, those who are uh, performing well and those who are not yet performing well, there's just no gender distribution there. It's not as though the women are, uh, are, are a second tier sad sack lot who, who don't get politics. Yeah. Not when you got Catherine McKenna and Jane Philpott and, uh, and uh, Mary Claude Bibeau and uh, Melanie Jolie. Uh, who are, uh, you know, at, at least as interesting and impressive in their jobs as, as, as the guys. So uh, what we've seen generally, not just in Canada but around the world, is that in the absence of specific uh, effort to promote women, not a lot happens, not a lot changes. When you make that specific effort, when you have quotas, frankly, uh, the, the, you, you don't wind up with a, with a, with a wildly less uh, competent uh, government, uh, sometimes quite the contrary. All right. You get the last word, Rosie. Well, and it's not just on the government side, right? I mean, we have the Conservative interim leader who is a woman and some of the most forceful uh, voices on the opposition side, Lisa Raitt, Michelle Rempel, and others, are also uh, pushing forth their voices as formidable uh, female politicians. So, no, we're not as far as we should be. But there are some other things happening on the, ha on the Hill right now, too. There's conversations about how to make work-life balance, which I'm not sure can actually happen. But they are looking at ways of maybe reducing the, the week, the question period week, down to four four days a week so that people could go, say, be with their children on, on the fifth day, which may make it a little bit easier for everyone, not just women. So we're not where we should be, but uh, there are some strong role models on Parliament Hill right now. And if we're trying to encourage people to get into politics, we're well on our way. All right. Good points, all of them, on all topics. Thank you, Rosie. And thank you, Paul. Chantel, we'll see you next week. Andrew, I'm not sure if he's back next week or not, but we'll find out soon.